my name is Sylvia Sykes, and I was asked by the Silton Foundation to talk to you guys a little bit about my experiences with swing dancing from the late 1970s on. Um, I have a couple of things to talk about first off. First, I have cystic fibrosis, so it causes me to cough. I've uh, tried to do this recording three or four times and stop when I coughed. It's not going to happen. So instead of stopping the recording, I'm just going to cough. So I apologize now if I have a little coughing fit. Don't worry. I'm fine. We'll move on. Secondly, I'm not really doing this as a lecture. I'm just going to be talking to the little green light, pretending there's a human there, um, <clears throat> about my experiences. So if you um, end up with a question or wish I had gone into something further, please feel free to contact me. I'm fine if you want to call me or text me or whatever, contact me. Um, I'm glad to discuss any stuff with you that I know of, swing dance wise. Um, you can reach me. I'm sure the Silton Foundation can give you the information if you can't find me online, but I'm easily found online. And uh, we have a little bit of business. This is being uh, sponsored by the Sultan Foundation. And so that foundation is for any West Coast swing dancers needing financial assistance or aid for dance education. If you'd like to apply, you can do so online at thesiltonfoundation.org. Again, thesiltonfoundation.org. The Silton Foundation gives over $10,000 a year to exceptional dancers in need plus tickets, event tickets, and uh, accepts, they also accept tax deductible, tax deductible donations through the website. And this is specifically for West Coast Swing Dancers. So if you're a West Coast Swing Dancer and you'd like to apply, just go to thesiltonfoundation.org. And if you're a swing dancer and you'd like to support the foundation, you can go there and donate as well. Um, I started, I came to swing dancing um, kind of officially in the late 70s. I was dancing before that, um, doing kind of my bad version of bad East Coast swing for the most part, with some eight count stuff in it, but that I had uh, seen in movies and whatnot online. I've been doing that since the mid 60s. There was no um, specific instruction I had. I didn't have, I didn't go to a studio. I didn't uh, have anybody to teach me stuff. So it was just what I saw in old movies and did the best I could to continue that. And in those days, that meant, um, this is pre-home recording stuff, so that meant you would watch a movie on, on, on TV at, let's say, 3 in the morning for the one little dance scene in it, and you would do the best you can to figure it out, and then eight or nine months later, you might see the same movie again. So it was slow going, and the interpretation of watching something once and then trying to recreate it um, a lot got lost in the translation. It was like a game of telephone, but just with one person. I would watch it, uh, try to uh, replicate it, and do horribly at it. So I'd been swing dancing for a long time, but um, not well. So uh, the first time I was able to kind of come into uh, people who were around me who were humans who were doing this dance was in the late, <clears throat> well, middle 60s, actually. Um, I lived in Thousand Oaks, California at that time, which was uh, only had two stoplights, uh, so it was a pretty rural place. But uh, my mom would drive my original dance partner, Jonathan Bixby, and I down to the Hollywood Palladium whenever there was a big band uh, that would be playing there so we could just watch people dance and try to do the best we can to copy from that. Um, so in the late 19, uh, late 70s, um, we were starting to teach dancing, hoping to make enough money to be able to find people to teach us better or to teach us more, to teach us at all. Um, <clears throat> and um, we came across Dean Collins, uh, who was a Southern California Lindy dancer for the most part. He's from New York. Um, he learned, uh, I think he's from New Jersey. His style of dancing, uh, a lot of people say, um, is the foundation of West Coast Swing. Uh, I think Dean would disagree with that, but that's up to you to make your decision. People can be influenced by somebody, even though the person they're influenced by was not intending that to happen. So Dean was a really great Lindy dancer. Um, we met him uh, through a lady named Shirley Feetsum, who's now uh, passed on, but Shirley was a really great 
fun lady and a great dancer, and she really helped out a lot of folks early in the early 80s by um, sharing um, VHS tapes of people dancing and clips from TV and whatnot to really help kind of disseminate stuff. And she's the one who gave me Dean Collins <clears throat> contact information. So Jonathan and I went and started taking lessons from Dean. And through that, we met a lot of the SoCal uh, Lindy and Bell Swing and Balboa dancers. And he started to uh, take us to uh, the Lion Dior, which was a venue in Downey that Kenny Wetzel had um, on Sundays. Uh, it was a DJ dance. Uh, at originally, well, originally he actually had a small combo. It was a three or four piece combo um, and then later moved to just DJ stuff. And also on Sundays at the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, brain fart uh, in Brea and Long Beach at Bobby McGee's. Uh, that's a restaurant chain in Southern California that at those points uh, had a small dance floor that was sunken. And on Sundays, um, either in Brea or Long Beach, they would um, have uh, folks um, come in and uh, the, the swing dance folks would come in um, uh, DJ stuff for free and then people come and have a little bit of a dance party there from about one to about six or seven at night um, and it was just to get together on on alternate Sundays so every Sunday there was a dance it just would be at a different place and so that's how I came into seeing kind of contemporary for the time swing dancing it wasn't just segmented so much into West Coast Swing, Lindy, Bell, blah 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 there were pure bell dancers and SoCal swing dancers or bell swing dancers and Lindy and West Coast, but most people just thought they were dancing. <coughs> so I got to meet everybody uh, through going to these dances every single week. And um, some people uh, were segmented into, I just do this one style, so I only dance to music that's this way. Um, but most of the folks that I was dancing with danced to almost every kind of song. So if it was fast, they might do Lindy. If it was really fast, they would do some kind of bow. If it was slower, they would do kind of a version of West Coast. So it was uh, less um, segmented than it is now. Um, and for my part, I don't, I've never thought of myself as just purely a Lindy dancer or a bow dancer or a West Coast swing dancer. Mostly I, um, I followed. So whoever was dancing, since I'm a follow for the most part, socially um if the leader was leading west coast swing that's what i did if they were leading lindy hop that's what i did if they were leading socal swing or balboa that's what i did so i was mostly doing whatever the leaders were doing so i never thought of myself as a west coast swing dancer even though i was in that world for quite a while um i don't think that i'm really somebody you should th talk to about west coast swing i was just a generic swing dancer who was allowed to hang out with y'all so early on, let's say early 80s, <clears throat> there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot of contests and whatnot going on at that point. Uh, they had conventions, but they're not like the conventions of today. They were mostly an excuse for people to get together, party, drink, and dance. Um, there was one in San Diego, San Diego Swing Dance Convention, and one in San Francisco put on by the Bay Swingers. So we would go to those, and, and going to that was an interesting thing because you could tell if someone was from Southern California, Northern California, just within the first one or two um, counts of a pattern on how they held your hand, the tension. Um, there was a regional variation, hugely different if you were a Northern California swing dancer versus a Southern California swing dancer uh, in the early 80s. So the regional variations were much more extreme and delineated than they would be now. Um, but we would just go and we would dance and they, sometimes they would have no contest. Sometimes they'd have a little fun contest every once in a while. They'd have like a little Jack and Jill or something fun, but it was a low, um, and it, it was a low priorities for the overall thing. It wasn't like the big deal to be in this contest. Uh, I'd say less than 10% of the people were in the contest. 90% of the people were there just to dance with each other and party and hang out and socialize. And that's what conventions were like for the most part. A lot of drinking, a lot of dancing. Um, slowly over the years, that has inverted into 
Now, when you go to a convention, most people are there to compete and few people and, and few people are there just to socialize. So it's kind of flip-flopped in, in the last 40 plus years. So in the early days, in the, in the early 80s, we would go to these conventions and you would see some people from out of town, but for the most part, um, it would be mostly folks from California or um, Arizona in, in, the, in where I was going here. Um, in about, I think, so the first US Open was 1983. Uh, and that was the first time I actually saw dancers from other parts of the country <clears throat> uh, competing. So we had, I think, I'm not exactly sure who was all there, but I know um, there was some, the first few years anyway, we had folks from Oklahoma, some from St. Louis, some from Texas and uh, California. And I'm sure there was other places too. Uh, but for the most part, uh, that was the first time I got to see uh, a lot of St. Louis uh, Imperial dancers and shag, St. Louis shag and Texas push whip and the Oklahoma stylings, which are a little bit different and Northern California, Southern California. Most of the people, uh, well, not most of the people, I'd say about 50% were kind of street dancers, just people who were social dancing and put a routine together to have fun to compete in this thing. And about 50% were from studios um, that were, um, a little bit more official and codified. So um, that was very interesting. The U.S. Open was super fun in those days. Not that it's not now, but I haven't been for a while. Um, it was small. Uh, there was still uh, a lot of social dancing and trading. So we would get together after the contest um, until wee hours of the morning and just trade steps and how do you do this and why do you do it that way and let's try this and just trade uh and that was um kind of how we disseminated stuff more than official uh teaching of big workshops of so and so teaching you how to do the blah 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 it was mostly just trading at three o'clock in the morning it was really fun so that's kind of how we started to to kind of know each other's styling and to have a little bit uh widen our education and widen our ability to to kind of see how other people dealt with the music and and what their basic stuff was like uh, in, in Texas, they did a lot of arm stuff, a lot of ropes and twists and things like that. Um, in St. Louis, the footwork was a little bit different. So we just had a, we had influences from each other, but they were um, not in such a codified or an official kind of way back in those days. And then the big deal happened in uh, 1989 for me was when there was a convention put on I think, it, I'm not sure, it might be the World Swing Dance Council. I can't remember who put it on, but I think Bob Bryant was involved with it maybe. And I apologize to whomever put it on and I don't know the name of it. But it was a big convention in Oklahoma City in 1989. And that's the first time we had a whole lot of people who were uh, coming together from different parts of the country. We had um, kids from St. Louis. Sorry about the phone call, just ignore it. Um, we had kids from St. Louis. We had some folks from um, uh, New York. We had uh, Carolina Shaggers. We had um, Texas Push Whip. We had folks from Oklahoma, folks from California, Nevada, um, and elsewhere. So it was the first time that all the first time that I became aware of like all the different regional variations coming together in a convention to to kind of share and get to know each other. It was a blast. It was great. So that was in 1989. That's when I first met Charlie and Jackie. Uh, Jackie, in those, in those days, um, all most of the swing dance stylings, the followers, which were uh, socially all female, uh, wore uh, heels and skirts or dresses. Everybody did, except Jackie McGee and I wore flats and pants. So we looked at each other across the room. We we're the only two follows there um, in flats and pants. So we kind of um, melded together like, and we also um, started on triple steps a lot. So we were pretty excited about meeting somebody else like from the same vague planet. Anyway, so uh, in those days, uh, we all danced to different sorts of music, but they, for the most part, all the music still swung. It was like one, a two, ba, ba, do. It wasn't one and two and one and two and it was sha, ba, do. Shot Badoo is a delayed triple. So that's kind of, um, even though all the styles were really different, St. Louis Shag, Imperial, West Coast Swing, um, 
Lindy Hop, Push, Whip. It was uh, Carolina Shag. It was all real different stylings, but we had um, a similarity in the kind of music we danced to in that it still swung. And um, dancing with each other was still possible. I mean, so like a shag, a Carolina shag dancer could could dance with an imperial dancer, could, could dance with that, 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 that. Because we all had a basic, um, our basic foundation was real similar in those days, even though the stylings were different and the music might be, one might be contemporary R&B, one might be big band swing, one might be r and you know, blues, but they all still swung. So we were able to kind of still dance together, even though, um, let's say the Texas Whip folks would dance to much slower music than um, Lindy Hoppers or Bow Swing dancers would, but it was still enough similar that we could we could still just dance with each other. So that was the for me that was the instance where where we really started to become a national um, awareness of who was out there, who was doing what in, in swing in the general overall thing of swing dancing. And back when I was uh, at like Bobby McGee's, um, I would see people like Jack Carey. This was before Jack and Annie uh, were a couple. And Jack was a, a Lindy dancer and I would watch him dance. And Annie was, was sort of a West Coast swing dancer. She had amazing footwork. So I would just always be glued uh, watching her. And I was always kind of torn about, should I watch Jack or should I watch Annie? And I kind of wished that they would get together. And they actually did, not because of that. But when they got together, it was really interesting to see how both of them uh, modified their stylings to be able to dance with each other. Jack slowed everything down to give Annie plenty of time and space to do her footwork. And um, Annie, uh, Annie wasn't just doing slow stuff. She would dance a little bit faster when she danced with Jack too. So it was, you, you would see a Lindy dancer and a, bal and a, sorry, and a West Coast dancer um, end up kind of morphing to be able to dance with each other. And so now you're creating hybrid uh, stylings, which was also really fun to watch. So um, back to blah, blah, blah. Let's see, where am I going with this? Okay, so uh, we did the early U.S. Open. Oh, back in the U.S. Open also, it was really fun not that this matters anything, it's just Sylvia reminiscing about the good old days, is um, there wasn't that many competitors. So we would all go out. Most of the competitors would go out after the U.S. Open, after awards. Um, we would go out to this place called Bell Isles, <coughs> <coughs> which was on Harbor Boulevard in Anaheim. It was called Home of Big Food. And they actually had huge portions of food. Their portions were ridiculous. So we would all go there, shoot the shit, hang out and eat big food. Like you would get um, a cantaloupe, a half a cantaloupe, it would be the size of a watermelon. You would get a sandwich that would be uh, a meal for two or three people. Your Coke would be like two liters with a straw that went way up in the air. It was, it was really weird. It was gross American stylings as far as how much you could get, uh, how much food could you serve somebody? So that was Belle Isle. Um, I remember, uh, well, Lance is gone, but um, Charlotte might remember um, Barry Jones, talk to Barry Jones. Anyway, we would just go there and have a good old time afterwards. So it was um, still a melting pot in those days in the early 80s, mid 80s, late 80s. So when the 90s kind of came about, we started um, recognizing the regional variations. Um, and trying to honor them. So uh, I'm sure that you all have been exposed to Team USA, which was Mario Robau and Valerie LaFamina. It was going to be Lance and Charlotte, but it ended up being Lance and Lynn Vogan. And Charlie and Jackie and Jonathan Bixby and myself, uh, we made a team to be at the US Open. We each, uh, we had a, a header and an outro, an intro and an outro that we, that Mario and I choreographed uh, together and uh, we each learned that. And then each uh, couple had a chunk of music that they just choreographed something to and we knitted it all together. And we, sh we did this remotely and by videotape because this was, you know, pre-internet stuff. So um, we met at my house and, uh, and tried to knit it together. It was a complete horrible mess. Mario's dad watched us um, at the open doing a practice and said, maybe you guys should wait till next year. But we decided, what the hey, why not? Let's just do it now. Because if we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. And we actually 
got through it for the most part uh, correctly once, and it happened to work because it was during the contest. I don't think we ever did it correctly again, so that was really lucked out. But we're trying to show that all the dances, even though the regional variations were quite different, that we all came from the same over, overarching family of, of swing dancing. Um, and then conventions started to change uh, in the 90s. They started to become a little bit more uh, oriented towards, um, towards competition than, uh, and workshops versus just kind of hanging out and, and trading stuff. So competitions became more prevalent. Uh, we had um, different degrees of things. So instead of just classic and showcase, you had open showcase, open classic, advanced classic. Um, you had Jack and Jill's that were just Jack and Jill's, but you had novice, intermediate, advanced, all-star, you know, so you started having these different degrees. And to do that, you, um, in West Coast Swing, you had a book, which you would get points in a big book. So it wasn't just, well, I'm, uh, I'm from, Smithville, Arkansas, and I'm just making these names up. And um, I'm the best dancer in Smithville, Arkansas, so I will be in the champions division because at home I'm a champion. But perhaps you're not at the same level as a champion from, let's say, Los Angeles. So they decided to um, to to try to codify levels for contests, uh, and that's what the book of points for uh, got to be. So you had to win a certain number of contests at a certain, um, you know, at a certain level to be able to move up to the next level. And you had to do so. Uh, you got more points um, if you were at a convention that was large and you got less points if you were a convention that's small <coughs> um, to try to mitigate that sort of difference. difference. So um, folks started coming to conventions and the point was to, to, take lessons, to take privates, um, and to take the workshops. But mostly that's when privates really started to be more heavily um, weighted so that you could do better in the contest, so you could get points, so you could move up the ladder to the next level. So it became much more codified in a, in a real different way. Um, and this was for West Coast Swing. Uh, Lindy Hop has never codified. Um, I don't think Shag, Carolina Shag has either. Uh, we have things, uh, we have basic ideas that we um, judge on for Carolina Shag and for, for Lindy Hop, but it's not codified in the same way West Coast Swing has been. So the uh, it's a business model that has really completely changed a lot of things in West Coast Swing, but it's been um, economically a big boon to the teachers because teachers make a whole lot more money in West Coast Swing than they do in Lindy Hop or Carolina Shag because they're less codified. Um, but it also has changed the feeling of conventions. Um, I'm not saying it's better or worse, it's just it's, it's a lot different. So um, conventions now are mostly um, workshops, privates, and, and competing, and less social dancing. It used to be that everybody would dance with everybody, and now um, it's a lot uh, more segmented as to who's going to be dancing with who socially and for how long people are going to stay up and, and dance in the ballroom uh, with the general public. So that's really, really different than it used to be. The other big deal is the music has changed greatly over the years uh, for West Coast Swing and also for Lindy Hop and um, a little bit for Shag, but a little less for, Shag, for Carolina Shag. So um, in, uh, taking a little bit of a detour here for Lindy Hop, Lindy Hop was danced um, mostly to big band swing or, or our uh, old rhythm and blues. <coughs> and um, it not necessarily fast. You could do Lindy Hop to medium slow temples, you know, like 130 on up. Um, it's not just fast. And there was a lot of different styles in in Lindy Hop. Um, there were smooth styles and, and aerial styles and fast and slow and blah, blah, blah. Footwork, uh, not footwork. Um, so it was a, a, a wide range of stuff in that, but still the music all basically swung, even though the tempos might be uh, quite varied. Um, I think it was sometime in the middle 90s. I can't remember what, because I've been trying to block it out of my memory. It was uh, in West Coast Swing. We became... Um, 
what we call the groove period, where um, I think about every five years, any um, any of the dances kind of go through a little bit of a of a cycle, and like five year cycles, ten year cycles, and twenty year cycles. Um, so the five year cycle there was what um, what are we going to do? Because they would be watching uh, West Coast Swing Dancers which gave the followers a lot more time to do footwork and stuff. And mostly Lindy Hop wasn't footwork oriented so much uh, in those days. So they slowed it down and started dancing to slower R&B stuff um, and even some non-swing stuff um, so that they could learn how to do footwork. So it was kind of, it was a good uh, excursion because uh, it allowed uh, Lindy Hoppers to be able to work on footwork and add that to the dance. The odd part about it was it just looked like poorly done West Coast Swing a lot of times. It was like bad West Coast Swing, so I wasn't quite sure why Lindy Hoppers were doing bad West Coast Swing. Why not do good West Coast Swing? But the good part about it was that it allowed uh, the community, the, the scene, to grow and learn some footwork and stuff to be able to bring back to the to the dance. And so when the groove period ended, we just got back to dancing to regular swing music. Um, the footwork was incorporated into the dancing with her, even when it was faster. So I think that we see these little excursions, um, in West Coast Swing, I'm sure there's lots of those excursions too. For a while there in the late nineties, uh, no, I'm sorry, late or middle nineties, late nineties, um, for leaders, a lot of the leaders weren't doing a lot of footwork. Uh, in West Coast Swing. Um, most of it was turns and spins and things like that. So uh, footwork was less prevalent in West Coast Swing. And then the Carolina Shaggers started to come out um, to compete in team co competitions and whatnot, and and also classics and, and, and Jack and Jill's and Strictly's. And so Carolina Shag is mostly all footwork. And so that uh, kind of pushed the West Coast Swing dancers back into doing footwork. So footwork kind of disappeared for West Coast Swing for a while and then got reintroduced, I think, from the influence with Shag, North Carolina Shag. Um, leaders started to having to do more footwork and triples came back for a while and and uh, rhythm changes, uh, footwork rhythm changes were a lot uh, more interesting from that influence than they had been for the last, you know, four or five years before that. And West Coast Swing followers heavily influenced Carolina Shag Follows. Uh, Carolina Shag Follows uh, originally were, not originally, but from the early 80s on, were more um, were more of a base on the dance, and it was mostly a, a leader-centric dance, and whereas West Coast Swing was mostly a follower-centric dance. So the Carolina Shag followers were like, hey, we would like to have a bigger voice in this, kind of like how the West Coast Swing Follows are able to <laughs> influence and and whatnot. So um, it's not that they changed completely, but Carolina Shag follows um, were, were started to do, bring more to the dance. It became a little bit more equal than than it had been because West Coast Swing, you know, uh, was able to influence Shag. Now all of this is also based on the music. So when you have music that is um, a delayed triple, bop ba do bop ba do, it's going to drive the the dance in a certain way. When you have music that is fast, it's going to drive it in a way that's different than if the music's slow. When I first came uh, in contact with folks from uh, Texas, which would be mostly, I guess, Mario Robau, um, I can. I think it was 91, um, he asked me to come to uh, an event that he was putting on at the, at the, at the ballroom uh, there. And uh, for me, fast dancing started at about 180. 180 up was fast, and anything from like 180 to 130 was medium, and then 130 to 100 was super slow, and we hardly ever danced that slow, unless we were doing slow bow. And when I got there, he asked me to judge a contest, and there was the slow and the and the fast contest. And the fast contest started at 112 beats a minute, and I was just like, what? Um, I'd never seen people dance swing that slow, um, which was amazing, but it was still 
music that swung, so it was still recognizable to me as a swing dance. So that uh, sort of thing really helped influence a lot of Lindy Hoppers uh, by watching how to dance slow um, and bring something to it and not just slow down fast dancing more slow. Uh, you know, it's not just take what you would do at 180 and, and slow it down to 110. Uh, you have to add more stuff to it to make it more interesting. Same thing happened, uh, I think, with some of the um, with some of the West Coast dancers when they were um, uh, influenced by some of the Lindy Hoppers to be able to, to do things a little faster than perhaps they wanted to uh, normally do. So um, again, things have changed just a hugely in the last, I'd say the last 12 or 15 years uh, in West Coast Swing. I think that if you're interested in a lot of this, you should talk to other people other than me because, again, I'm not a West Coast Swing dancer. I was just um, a swing dancer who followed West Coast Swing. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, partner with Ramiro Gonzalez, who some people think of as a West Coast dancer. I think of him as just as a badass swing dancer. <coughs> um, we got together because... Um, it was just, I had fun dancing with him. Uh, I met him at that uh, infamous uh, 1989 Oklahoma convention. Um, and then I met him at the U.S. Open. And we would just have fun social dancing together. And I didn't have, um, I was happy just to just to hang out and, and follow. Add a little bit here and there. I do influence my leaders, but I don't do it in big ways that the audience can see. I influence subtly so that most of the leaders don't know I'm influencing them, but I, I do. Um, anyway, Romero and I had a really good time dance together, so we would um, uh, hook up to, sorry, <coughs> hook up to dance in Strictly's because it was fun and we didn't have to work at stuff. There was um, a contest, I think, I think it was the first uh, Grand National Dance Contest that Charlie and Jackie put on, and this was in Atlanta. Um, they had um, a classic. They didn't have a Strictly contest, I don't think. They just had a classic contest. So Romero and I tried to put together a routine, which was um, ill-advised. <laughs> we Neither of us are good at remembering things. So um, Romero wasn't quite sure how to choreograph stuff at that time. And he was like, well, I don't know what to do. So we picked a song that we liked. Um, it was kind of an old R&B tune. And um, I said, just let's just dance to it. So he would dance to it. And then I'd say, okay, let's put this move and this move. Do you remember what those are? And he goes, no. And then we would kind of figure those out. And then we tried to put it together by just kind of social dancing and stringing a bunch of stuff together so that we could have a, a little routine to do. Um, and as you remember, we went out there and we probably did the first three or four moves in order. And then we just social danced the rest of it because we couldn't remember. We couldn't remember it. Neither of us could because <coughs> I'm not a routine dancer, neither is he. But we had a couple moves that we knew. And so when he would have the feeling like, OK, here's that move we were going to do, he would lead me into it. And we would do a kind of a fancy move uh, that really wasn't choreographed, but it was at least, uh, you know, at least they knew what the move was. So we had a good time doing that. And then we decided just, you know, that's when Strictly started to come about. So we just were in Strictly Swings. And I was just love dancing with Romero because he's one of the best movers on the planet. He really doesn't, he's kind of like nobody else. Um, Norma Miller, who was uh, one of our Lindy Hop um, founders and queens, uh, who died uh, in 2009, had, um, she was at an event uh, in Houston, um, uh, uh, International Swing Dance Championships, and uh, she was watching people dance and watching instructors dance. She was like, nah, I don't know, because eh, there was a lot of step, step in, um, Houston swing out, um, Dallas, swing out stuff. It was just a, a contemporary swing, black swing dancing, not so much uh, specific West Coast or whatever. Um, she wasn't, she was liking it okay, but she wasn't that impressed specifically until she saw Romero dance. And she said, 
Now that guy can move. That is a great, so she just loved Vermeer. He was one of her favorite dancers ever, even though she was a Lindy Hopper and, and there's no way that Vermeer would be considered a Lindy Hopper, but he was just a badass mover. So um, Vermeer and I just teamed up and we did a lot of Strictly Swings and had a really good time. And we were mostly concerned about rhythm and interplay between lead and follow. Um, back in those days, um, it was, uh, most of the music still swung and then slowly it became more contemporary music, which oftentimes did not swing. Then you would have, um, sometimes you would have options where you could pick, uh, blues or contemporary. So we would always pick blues cause it was closer. I, I'm an old fart, so, um, I don't listen to too much contemporary Music. I do listen to um, contemporary R&B, but I didn't know a lot of the music I was dancing to. So a lot of times in a Jack and Jill um, or a Strictly, I'd be dancing to a song that I'd never heard before, though everybody else was able to hum along with it. Grandma here was completely oblivious. So um, when we were able to have a, a soul chunk, we would get we could pick blues contemporary soul. We would always pick soul because at least I had heard of it before. And not that all soul music swings, but most of it swung. So that was good. So if you can kind of look back on YouTube um, and look at things, um, I'd say, you know, like look at uh, Jack and Jill's or Strictly from the, the, the late 80s or let's say yeah, middle 80s, like 1985 to 1989, 90, you're going to see kind of a certain style. And then you go from like 90 to 97 or 98, you're going to see stuff has changed grossly. <clears throat> you're going to see the music has changed. You're going to see the influences from Sh uh, Carolina Shag into West Coast, West Coast into Carolina Shag, uh, footwork into Lindy, um, some of the moves from Lindy into West Coast. You're going to start to see these influences. Um, I think it's an interesting thing to watch. So I suggest you do that. I, I can't, I, if you, again, if you want to contact me, I have lists and lists and lists of things I can mail you, uh, or email you or text you or Instagram you or however you all can communicate these days, um, to, uh, to give you an idea of like what to look for on, on YouTube, um, so you can kind of see the, this, this progressions. Cause I think it's important that you know the history uh, uh, of what you're doing. So in Lindy Hop, we always hark back to the roots of Lindy Hop, which was um, folks from, from the uh, late twenties, early thirties. It's not that <clears throat> we only copy them. <clears throat> it's not that we just do recreations, but when we innovate, we're trying, not that we always, make it, but we're trying to always have a touchstone from the roots. So when we innovate something, we had footwork, we had ideas, we had uh, different stylings. Um, we want to make it so that it's, um, it's recognizable. If one of the old timers, if, you know, Frankie came back or George Lloyd or, or Shorty Snowden or somebody came back and watched us do Lindy Hop today, they would at least recognize the Lindy Hop and go, wow, that's cool what you've done with this dance. They would recognize it as the same dance morphed because dances will morph. And Lindy Hop from 1930 was really different than from 1935 or 1940. Huge difference. Part of that was because the music changed. And in all dances, music is the driver of the dance. The most important driver of the dance is the music. The music isn't just a happenstance thing that happens to be in the room with you. It's the what you dance to. So the music is going to drive the dance. Um, you can do any movement you want to any kind of music, but it doesn't mean you're dancing to the music. It just means you're dancing in the same temp time in the same space as the music, but it doesn't mean that you're actually connected. So when you're connecting to the music, you're dancing to that music, how the music drives you, is going to heavily influence the dance. Um, for me, looking back for West Coast, or Sir Lindy Hop, <clears throat> if you look at um, like 1935 Lindy Hop, and then you look at like 1945 Lindy Hop, it, or 19, 
40 Lindy Hop. Uh, that five year difference is huge. The, the music went from swing, but, but it was a little bit of a trad jazz undertone still with it to like big band swing. Big band swing drove the dance in, in completely different ways than early, than early swing did. Um, and there's, <clears throat> um, in, and I'm sorry, I'm just rambling, but in, um, in Lindy Hop, uh, about 10 years ago, we went through a, another little stage of dancing to traditional jazz, like New Orleans trad jazz stuff. And that drove the dance in a really different ways because trad jazz has more of a, it has less of a swing to it and more of a Charleston feel. And so if you're dancing Lindy Hop to that music, it's going to drive you really differently than if you're dancing to like a regular swing song, like a big band swing song or a contemporary swing song. Um, so we went through these little stages like that. And so you can watch, uh, go on YouTube and look at, at either um, it, it, like five-year chunks and you can see happen in West Coast Swing, Carolina Shake, everything. You, you watch the music, listen to the music, watch the dance, and then go five years above or five years below and you can see the music and the dance has changed. The dance is going to be influenced by the music. So when contemporary music started to become more of the, the norm in West Coast Swing, the dance really changed a lot. Um, I mean, kids came, kids, kids came in, they're all uh, super middle-aged adults now, but to me, they were kids. When the kids came in, um, you know, they didn't want to necessarily dance to this same old music that everyone been dancing to. Um, uh, you know, just recorded the same old song. They wanted to dance to new stuff. They wanted to dance to contemporary things. And so most of the contemporary music um, did not swing. Some still swung, and that was uh, when you were dancing West Coast Swing to a contemporary song that, that had a swing beat to it, then you still did, sw you know, you're still swinging. When you were dancing to something that didn't swing, of course the dance is gonna change. The, the effect of the dance is gonna change how it's going to drive the dance, what opportunities it opens up, what opportunities it closes off, it's going to, is going to be affected by the music you dance to. So when people stopped dancing to um, music that swung and, and blues, um, it really it changed a, a great deal. And then the music also, over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, um, the contemporary music has, of course, changed because contemporary music is contemporary and it doesn't stay the same. Um, so that's how um, over the last 15 or so years that the lyrical style of, of West Coast Swing, uh, when you don't have to actually take the specific steps, you're not doing triple so much, you have what um, is referred to as the essence of West Coast Swing, which I kind of don't understand. I'm not saying that I think it's bad. It's that um, I'm an old fashioned swing dancer, so I never quite got the idea of, of how the dance, I saw the dance more from a swing dance to something much was much more a lyrical and a, a kind of a ballroom looking dance to me. Um, what I, what I enjoyed about that transition was the level, uh, the skill level was, um, really increased the, the ability of the dancers over the, uh, from about 19, I was sorry, about, let's say 2005 to 2015 or 2020, um, really started to increase. And then from 2010 to 2020, it's exponentially even more so. The, um, the training, the codification has taken some of the, um, individuality and the regional variations out of West Coast Swing, but it has grossly enhanced the ability, the technical ability of the dancers. Um, the dancers, uh, somebody in a, in a novice contest now is a much, much uh, better, more trained dancer than, um, let's say, a champion was, you know, 25 years ago. Um, so it has really in, um, enhanced the ability of the dancers, even though it has really changed the dance a lot. I used to judge at the U.S. Open every year because I had competed. <coughs> I've competed in and um, placed in West Coast Swing, Carolina Shag on a national level, um, Lindy Balboa Bal Swing, um, 
I've competed in all those things at a national level. So they would have me judge those things since uh, the US Open couldn't really afford to have a whole panel of Lindy Hop judges, a whole panel of West Coast Swing judges, a whole panel of Shag, blah, blah, blah. So basically they had West Coast Swing judges uh, from different regions. And then, you know, a couple of people who like me, who knew a little bit uh, more, who are a little bit more generalist than, than um, deep dive uh, dancers in a specific uh, level. So I would be able to, to judge because I, I had been competing in all those things. Um, and near the end of my being able to judge at the US Open, which was, uh, I guess, 2008, 2007, 2009, somewhere in that category, uh, they started to have, <clears throat> that's when the call for swing dance content, content started to be um, asked for because the dance was mor morphing so much. <laughs> Sorry for the coughing. Was morphing so much that some people were saying, "Is, is that still swing dancing?" So they had um, the the U.S. Open had uh, brought in a swing content as part of their uh, judging criteria, and I don't remember what the con numbers were, but it was like classic had to be eighty percent swing, and showcase had to be sixty percent swing. Uh, recognizable swing, you know, so it wasn't just anything goes at that point. So um, I remember the first year that that came in, uh, we were supposed to either give someone a violation if you thought as a judge they did not have enough swing content. If it was iffy, then you gave them a warning. And I remember um, in one contest I gave, I gave, uh, I gave out like two or three warnings and uh, two people I didn't give any warning to and everybody else I gave a violation to. Because for me, I, I couldn't see the swing dancing in it as I wasn't a trained West Coast, contemporary West Coast person at that point. So the music didn't swing. The dancing, the, if, they, if the dancing swung, they weren't dancing to the music. So if the music's not swinging and it, it just didn't look like swing to me, it looked like people were doing underarm turns, but you can do an underarm turn or an underarm pass to the follow in cha-cha, in waltz, in, you know, merengue. And it doesn't mean an underarm turn isn't necessarily a swing dance move. So I wasn't able to discern the swinginess of it. So they kind of said, oh, well, you know, this was swing and that was swing. And I said, I, I didn't see how it was, but, you know, so the next year when I judged, I didn't, if I, unless it was really, super, super blatant for me. I didn't give anybody a violation or a or a, a warning. And then I got asked, well, why didn't you violate these people? I said, I, I really am not trained well enough to, to understand the difference between couple A, whom you all see as a swing dance, and couple B, whom you see as no swing dance. To me, they look the same because I'm, I'm not part of the committee, or I'm sorry, <clears throat> I'm not part of the community in such a way to be able to see these subtle differences. I'm sure there are differences. I'm not saying that they didn't exist. I'm just saying that as an, as an old style dancer, I was unable to see the difference. So that's kind of when I realized I needed to kind of get out of the, get out of West Coast Swing because I didn't really know what I was looking at. <coughs> and as a competitor, I can surely tell you, um, being in a Strictly was fine because whoever was dancing with me knew what they were getting. But it was unfair to the West Coast leads who got me in the, in the champion Jack and Jills. They're like, uh-oh, I got that girl who, who can't do anything. So <laughs> so even though I used to uh, com compete along with uh, the West Coast Wing Dancers and the champion Jack and Jills, um, they were called Jack and Jills back in the day, um, I... Uh, I just realized it was time for me to get out, which I did. Uh, so I really can't speak to much of West Coast Swing from about the the late 2000, you know, 2009, 2010 on. I, I'm really, I'm completely ignorant because I don't go to those conventions anymore. That's, we did have some crossover conventions for a while. Tea Party um, and a couple other ones. Um, but the crossover conventions are less. It's more segmented as to West Coast Lindy Hop, Bal Bal Swing, um, Carolina Shag, we all kind of are back to our segmented styles. Even though a lot of dancers will 
will go to different conventions. I know a lot of, I mean, I started going to Carolina Shag stuff in 1991. I drugged Lance Shermoan, if you remember Lance. I drugged Lance Shermoan to the uh, national uh, Shag Nationals um, in Myrtle Beach. Uh, and we had a blast dancing, but anyway, uh, you know, so we have West Coast Swing Dancers who go to Carolina Shag, Shag Dancers, Carolina Shag Dancers who come to West Coast. Some West Coast people go to Lindy Hop, some Lindy Hoppers go to West Coast, some Lindy Hoppers go to Carolina Shag. Balboa people and Lindy people kind of go back and forth. So it's um, it's kind of still mixing, but the it's, we don't have regional style so much anymore as we have just the, the differentiation between, I'm sorry for my coughing. <coughs> We don't have so much regional variations within a style because most of us uh, through YouTube and um, and traveling, though we haven't been traveling the last couple of years because of COVID, um, we have homogenized each of our each of our styles. So West Coast Swing is more homogenized. Lindy Hop is more homogenized. Balboa is more homogenized. Bal Swing is more homogenized. Carolina Shag is more homogenized within themselves. Um, so the regional variations of any of this are, have disappeared. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, because of, uh, the technology. Um, but in the old days before te the technology was there, um, even within West Coast Swing, there would be vast differences, um, just between one, one town and the next town. Um, and so I think when... The, what's really driven the changes for, for all of our dances is technology and the music. So before uh, the early 80s, there was uh, no really home recording devices. And if you wanted to record something, you had a video camera that was this big and you needed to have Klieg lights because the lux on the camera was so poor that you couldn't, you know, just video in the dark. So you, if you go online, uh, you can see old Bobby McGee's footage. We talked about Bobby McGee's at the beginning of this rant I'm giving you. Um, that was this huge video camera and, and these Klieg lights. So they would turn the Klieg lights on. So what appears to be social dancing was really show off dancing because when the Klieg lights would come on, everybody knew they were on tape uh, and so people would show off. So it was a still so show off dancing. So there's very little social dancing that we can watch um, be from, you know, from before the early 80s um, on any style, whether it's Carolina Shag, Lindy Hop, West Coast Swing, there's very little social dancing because it when to to be recorded, it was to be known. Uh, it was there wasn't a stealth, you know, little iPhone that could do something in the dark uh, to be able to record people dancing in a social way. Um, when any of the recordings you see, uh, the people being recorded are quite obviously being recorded. And so they're going to be dancing a little bit differently than if they weren't re being recorded. So keep that in mind when you're looking at, at old stuff is that very little social dancing um, is on record. So mostly what we're seeing is show off dancing, uh, which is not a bad thing either. But uh, especially in Lindy Hop, if you watch something like Hell's a pop, and that's not how Lindy Hopper social dance. We weren't just throwing each other around the room. Um, so social dancing has taken a, has taken um, has taken a, a a detour, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, in Lindy Hop, Bal Swing, Balboa, and definitely in West Coast Swing, probably in Carolina Shag, um, because of the technology and uh, the ability for people to watch something, uh, watch somebody dance from, let's say Alaska and be able to incorporate that where you would not have come across those people from Alaska before that. Uh, the homogenization of all of our dances, individual uh, styles of, of uh, individual types of swing dancing have been way more homogenized because of the technology coming in and with home recording devices or whatnot in the early 1980s. Um, you can slow something down, you can record it, watch it a hundred times and be able to get it. As I mentioned early on in this rant, um, when I first started trying to learn how to do any kind of swing dancing, it was watch, watch somebody on the dance floor and then try to copy it or 
watch a movie on television and then not see it again for eight or nine months. So if you watch one thing and you can't rewind it or watch it again and again, it's going to be a really different influence than if you can rewatch it, rewatch it, slow it down. So when that ability came in the early 80s, I think that's a heavy influence into all of our dances. And then the choice of music has the next heavily, most heavily thing, most heavily thing, uh, the thing that most uh, heavily influenced our dances aside from the codifications. So you've got to realize that the music is the most important thing. It's going to drive how you dance. So if you want to change the dance, you need to change the music. Um, and how the music changes the dance, I think it's really important to look at. And I don't think that there's any kind of dancing that people enjoy doing um, that is bad. I'm not uh, giving any kind of, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that contemporary West Coast Swing is not good. I, it's, it's an amazing dance that I'm, that's way beyond my capability of being able to do. Um, it's just really very different than when it was more of a swing dance. Um, and that's because of the influence of the music changing, but the, the, every dance is going to, is, is going to change. Like Lindy Hop has stayed Lindy Hop, but West Coast Swing came from Lindy Hop and it's a completely different dance. West Coast Swing was a completely kind of different dance in the, let's say the mid 1980s from Lindy Hop. You could see it as, as, uh, coming from, but had broken away. And I think contemporary West Coast has broken away again, uh, which is, is, is not a bad thing. It's just, it's a different, it's a different dance now. And I think it's important for people to see where the dance came from, uh, especially for the newer dancers is to try to look back way back as far back as you can look as at the dances and how the music influenced the dancing. Uh, look at, watch the dances, look at what, what, what's going on. Is it leader centric? Is it follower centric? Is it footwork centric? Is it pattern centric? and see how the music, when the music changes, how that changes each one of those aspects of the dance. And I think that will help you in your journey uh, as you're learning new, uh, you know, contemporary, contemporary versions of whatever dance you're doing. So as you're doing, learning contemporary West Coast, I think it's important to know where the dance came from and what the influences on the dance were way back in the day. Uh, the more that you know the history, I think the more that you can um, bring the richness of the history to the dance and, and influence it and influence the dance in, in good and new and modern ways. So I know that I've rambled on here for about an hour. I don't know if this was interesting to you or not, but again, I have, um, I've been, I've been swing dancing something since the mid 1960s. Um, I was involved with uh, contemporary, contemporary, I was involved in the general public out there since about uh, the late 70s. So um, I have a lot of experience with a lot of different people, and a lot of different stuff. Um, I didn't know really what to talk about here specifically other than the, the music is going to change the dancing and for you to, as uh, newer dancers, uh, to really do your do your studying and look look at the history i think that will help you in your endeavors to be a better dancer and to drive the dance and to create the dance in better ways than if you don't know the history so again if you want to contact me you can contact me i'm happy to talk to you about almost anything you want to talk about um swing dance wise um feel free uh, to, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to share my, my experiences with you. And again, if you would like to donate or apply for a scholarship, please visit the siltonfoundation.org for more information, uh, to apply for the annual grants and, or to donate. Um, again, thanks for listening to this. Sorry if it was uh, a waste of your time, but, um, I'm happy to have been part of the overall swing dance community uh, for 50 years. And, um, and I, I hope you continue to dance. And remember the most important thing about dancing isn't what somebody else thinks about your dancing. It's you and your partner having fun to the music and not hurting each other. If you're having fun, your partner's having fun and no one's getting hurt, 
That's the only thing that really matters. The people in the chair shouldn't matter. Uh, dancing really is a, it's all about what you bring to it and your experience that matters the most. Not so much what the judges say, um, unless you're in a contest, of course, but um, dancing is a social uh, endeavor ultimately. And I would hope that you would keep that in mind too, is that you need to have fun, um, have fun with the person you're dancing with. It's okay to make mistakes uh, because mistakes are just, Hey, at least I'm trying and we're just going to communicate and see what we can make out of it. So I hope, I wish you luck in your journey of, of learning how to dance and to keeping, to have fun. And I'm going to stop rambling now. Uh, thanks for listening and uh, contact me again if you would, uh, if you'd like any more information. Bye.